blessing. We rejoice in the opportunity again to gather together around the Word of God. And uh, that is what we do here. We uh, worship God by preaching the Word of God, teaching the Word of God with the intent that believers can be perfected to do the work of the ministry. And it's a great blessing to be able to do that. As we go through the book of Romans, we're looking at uh, issues, of course, that are incredibly important to our understanding the whole foundation of what goes on in the later chapters of the book of Romans. The intent of the book of Romans is to equip, equip us. It gives us all of the um, apologetical uh, tools to be able to engage the culture wherever it is at. And if there ever was a day that we have diversity uh, of doctrine uh, and falsity of doctrine, we're living in that day. And it seems to grow more every year. Uh, although we've always had diversity of doctrine, what seems to be prevalent today is the acceptance of this diversity we almost celebrate the diversity of doctrine. Now, I celebrate diversity in cultures. I think that's a good thing. I, I, we don't all have to be the same uh, in order to get along with one another. But when it comes to the issues of, of being a Christian, that isn't defined broadly. That's defined what? Narrowly. Very narrowly. Christ said, broad is the way which leads to destruction, and few there be that find it. Or narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. And not, it's not a broad way, it's a very narrow way. So tonight we're looking at this calling of the priesthood of the believer, and the ministry of the priesthood of the believer as servants in grace. And this morning we established that grace is a supernatural enabling or empowerment of believers as they yield to the indwelling Christ, the Holy Spirit of Christ, and then the power of God is released through our doing the Word of God. Otherwise, lives are touched and people are changed. Wherever we go, we ought to create, you know, just by the very nature of our presence, create friction and tension. I know that is true. People who know who I am know I'm the pastor here. Wherever I go, Wherever I'm at, they know I stand for certain things. I don't even have to open my mouth. There's a tension immediately. You can feel it sometimes when you walk in the room. Uh, because people do not like what we teach. Now, uh, I'm not going to change my teaching to be liked. <laughs> that is a dangerous way to live your life. So tonight we're going to look at grace is divine power within the believer. Now, it's there. It's already there. You have everything that is there. And we're going to look at Second Peter tonight, if you want to go over there, uh, because we're looking at this, this energy, this spiritual power that lies within us. And Second Peter chapter 1 gives us some very practical applications of it. But God's vocational calling to evangelize and make disciples comes with all spiritual resources Necessary to do, uh, necessary to the work of the ministry. Otherwise, there is no one in this room who is born again of the Spirit of God, has the Spirit of God, who can say, well, I, I'm, I'm not really called to do that. No, you are. And no one can say, I don't have the resources to do that. You do have the resources to do it. First of all, you've got a testimony. If you're saved, you have a testimony. Testimony is how you got saved. I'm saved and here's how I got saved. You don't have to know anything else in the Bible to be able to share a testimony of how you got saved. And I can do that in less than three minutes. I can share my testimony with someone. I used to work on it when I'd come to a door or go out door, uh, you know, uh, canvassing. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is say, you know, I'm Lance Ketchum, I'm the pastor of Shepherd's Fold Baptist Church. 
and uh, I'd ask them, uh, what is your religious background? And they'd tell me, and I'd say, well, I am such and such, and I was how I got saved, and in a matter of just a few minutes, I could give a testimony of how I was born again, and uh, my, re my religious background, how I came to, be tr came to trust in Christ. But we have a vocational calling to do that, and we are empowered to do it. So no one has an excuse to say, I, I, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. Now, the question isn't that you can't. The question is that you won't. And that is where it comes down to the brass tacks of our accountability and our unfaithfulness to what we've been called to do. So God has given his ambassadors the message he wants delivered. The illumination of the meaning of his inspired words that he's, he's given us that. He has given us the indwelling spirit of Jesus Christ to go with us wherever we go. He is with us always, even under the end of the world, end of the age. What God has called us to do, he has enabled us to do already. And God has stated this fact in 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. And every believer, for, for every believer to know, what does that mean? No excuses. I, I'll take somebody, they'll give me an excuse. Well, I can't do that. I say, God, you have no excuses. There are absolutely no excuses for what you are asking us to do, or what, for what you are being asked to do. No excuses whatsoever. Now, I want to ask you to, I want to just let you be stated. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to read this scripture and expound upon it a little bit, because I, I want to expound upon it as we go through, and I don't want you having to stand for the next 10 or 15 minutes. So let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you tonight for that you have given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. We thank you, Father, for not only the gift of salvation, but the gift of grace that is so much more. That, Lord, what you have begun in us, you will continue in us. And we rejoice tonight in all that you have done and will do, and how you have chosen to use us. Oh, God, that is such a privilege, and we don't take it for granted. And help us, Lord, to be faithful to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Simon Peter here is addressing this issue about being a servant of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 1, he says, Simon Peter, a servant, one, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. What that means is when Peter says that, he is saying, what I'm saying is the word of God. And he is qualifying that fact, that the fact he is an apostle. And then he says, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He's saying this, this is written to those who are saved. Because you've received the righteousness of God uh, and uh, the righteousness of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. That's justification. So you, you are of like precious faith. Now that's an important terminology. Of like precious faith is common faith. Common salvation, common faith. There is only one faith, right? Ephesians chapter 4. There is one Lord, one faith. There's not many faiths. Well, there are. But there's only one right one. And that's the word of God. So he says now in verse 2, grace and what? And peace be multiplied unto you. How, how is that grace and peace multiplied? The supernatural enabling of God and God's peace, how is that multiplied? Well, through the knowledge of God. Now, you wouldn't see this in the English translations, but the word knowledge here is epigenosis, not gnosis. Gnosis is an intellectual knowledge. Epigenosis is a relational knowledge, and any time you see an epi prefix before any word in the Greek, it takes us to its highest extreme. I always explain this by saying, I know good piano music, I love good piano music, and I uh, um, can recognize it when, when it happens. But there is a difference between that and someone who has actually been able to sit down and play good piano music, right? And the difference is this. Hours and 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 hours, and I'm not done yet. 
and hours and hours and hours and hours of spending time with that beast. And I've had to listen to some of that with two of my girls who took the lessons. Sometimes it was painful. <laughs> but eventually it came out. Well, what is this? That's what this word is. You spend, it's a relational knowledge. It's an intimate knowledge that comes with being with Christ and working together with him. So the, how this all happens is through this intimate relational knowledge of God and of, our, and of, and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto a few of us some things. You going to let me say that? Hey, no, pastor, that's not right. What does it say? Hath given unto all us all things. Hath given us un, unto all, us all things. Us is all of us that pertain unto life and godliness. That means living our lives according to the will of God and living our lives godly. We've been given everything. Divine power has given us all of that. Again, through the what? Knowledge. Guess what this word is? Epignosis. It's not intellectual knowledge, it's relational knowledge of Him. That hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby, by that, whereby are given, now that's a perfect passive, otherwise, God's done it, we have nothing to do with it, God's given it to us. Perfect passive, uh, has, are given, whereby are given unto us exceeding great megistos, that is the word we get mega from. So it's, it's great as it, beyond just something big. It's mega. Megistos. Uh, giving unto us, you know, megistos promises, the precious promises. They're extreme uh, large promises. That by these, by these precious promises, ye might be, this is subjunctive mood, meaning God has opened the door of possibility through this perfect tense giving. Because you have the spirit of Christ living within you. You have this power living within you. You have, uh, has been given, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now this word partakers is a koinonos. It is a, it is a verb form of the koinonia, which we translate fellowship. So the concept here is partners or partakers of the what divine nature? What is the divine nature? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, nature here is phusis in the Greek. Uh, that means it is growth by germination. Is the word we use for Genesis? It is how something comes from comes into existence. So, the divine nature is a growth by germination or reproduction of something spiritual. So. We have been given the divine nature. What does that mean? The ability to partner in producing regenerate souls for the new Genesis. <laughs> but you, that is a wow truth for me. This is a, one of the gifts of, of, of God in Jesus Christ to us. When we have the spirit of Christ within us, now we can be partners with God in producing a regenerate people. And, of course, opening up a whole new genesis. We become the vehicle for that. God is using the human agent. Why? Because we've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Well, that's a powerful text. Powerful text. Look at John 15, verse 16. John 15, and verse 16. Now, the reason I want you to open your Bible, because I imagine every one of you have got a pencil or pen, and you want to take some notes, right? I didn't spend, uh, you know, four hours on each one of these verses so that I could just tell you, I want you to take this home with you. I want you to remember it. I want you to take some notes. I want you to be able to use it. Amen. Uh, wave your pencil at me. Amen. Hey, praise the Lord. Everybody on camera, you can't see that, but everybody waved their pencil at me. That's, that's a good sign. 
He says, Christ says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now this is a vocational choosing. And ordained you. Jesus says, put you in the vine. This is the vine and the branches text, John 15. Or Jesus says, put you in the vine exactly where he wants you. That, that's what this word ordained you means. That, or to the intent, you should go and bring forth what? Fruit. What is, why are we to abide in the vine? Well, to bring forth fruit. God has put you in the vine. That's the church. He has put you connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the body, or in the concept of the vineyard. You are, he is the vine, we are the branches. That's another metaphor of the church. That your fruit, you could go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should what? Remain. Well, what does that mean? It should last. That's what the word remain means. Fruit produced while abiding in the vine is imperishable or eternal fruit. What does that mean? It's going to live forever. You know, you, you can take fruit that you have. Uh, you know, my, we used to always grow potatoes and we grew potatoes because it was one of those fruits you could put in the root cellar and even if it started growing down there, you could still eat it. Another fruit we could put in the root cellar was uh, um, apples. You could have a lot of apples. And so mom made a lot of apple pies and apple sauce and a lot of other stuff from apples. They lasted a long time. Another one was onions. You'd keep them for a long time. And uh, so we had a lot of that. Well, that's the kind of fruit here, but that fruit will perish eventually, right? A root cellar, by the way, is a hole in the ground. Uh, that's called a foundation with a wood stairs that go down in a wood, you know, and ours was a, uh, even a dirt floor in it, but uh, that's where mom put all her canned goods down there, and they did stay okay in the winter. Didn't freeze, and it stayed warm enough to make work down there. But uh, the point here is we, we can now, we can produce fruit that should remain. It's imperishable. True fruit that's produced in, a, in abiding to the vine is eternal fruit. And that is the fruit that I like that text when we say that we'll be called to glory. We're going to meet them in the air. That's the people who have de are dead. They've already been, uh, they're already in heaven and their spirit and soul and their body is resurrected. But we're gonna, we meet Jesus and them in the air. Uh, that is this fruit that many of us have won to Christ. Now, I've got some fruit I'm looking forward to meeting when I, right there in the air. It's going to be a family reunion right there when we meet the Lord in the air. And I tell you, it's not, not going to be a, a, a time of uh, a sadness. That's going to be a time of great joy, rejoicing. And uh, immediately there's going to be some people we're going to know there. And they're, and they're going to be standing right there waiting for us. And uh, that'll be a great time of, of rejoicing and, and reunion. So, that your fruit should remain, that, to the intent by abiding in the vine, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, it may he may give it to you. What is, the, what is the precursor to that? What is the requirement? You must abide in the vine. Don't expect God to answer your prayer if you're not abiding in the vine. If you're abiding in the vine, God says you're connected, there is union, and you can expect, as long as you're praying in the will of God, that God will answer that prayer. Now, he might not answer it when you want it answered, but he'll ask answer it in his time. Romans 7, 18. Here is the Apostle Paul speaking. And he is speaking to sinners as a sinner. That's important to see. He is talking about having the same struggles that every believer has. Now, I, I'm always grateful for people who grew up in homes that uh, were very godly homes and they didn't start bad habits and they don't have their fi brains filled with bad memories of, of all kinds of horrible, wicked, sinful things. But uh, that's not the case with most people. Most people have been saved out of a life of sin. I certainly was. And so I think Paul, although he grew up in a very self-righteous group of people understood what it meant to be a sinner. So in verse 18 he says, For I know that in me, Paul says, in me, 
that is in my flesh, this body, he says, dwelleth no good thing. What's he saying? There's nothing good about me <laughs> in his flesh. For the will is present with me, otherwise I have a want to. I want to do what's right. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. I can't do it in the flesh. The flesh or the old man is powerless to do what God commands or demands us to do. Powerless. Paul says, in the flesh, I can't find how I'm going to ever get what God asked me to do done. My flesh is incapable of doing that. Okay, you just got to first base. You want to get home? Well, you got to follow the line here. First thing is to say, I can't do what you want me to do, God. What you're asking me to do is, empower, is, is impossible in this body of flesh. I can't do it. Christ said you couldn't, by the way, in John 15. Go with me to Romans 8, 7. Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind, what is that? That is the mind preoccupied with temporal worldliness and as opposed to spirituality, eternal, eternal, eternal things. When we become preoccupied with temporal worldliness, we cling on to it. And we are very careful never to go outside of a security of that temporal worldliness. We want we cling on to life to the place of compromise. So that's a carnal mind. And what does he say? The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not standing for God. You are, that person is actually standing against God. For it is not subject, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. Subject means it's not subordinate to it. it it does it not recognize the lordship and the sovereignty of God. And so there it's not subject. It's not a subject of the lordship of Christ and the law of God. And neither indeed can it be. Even if it wants to, it can't be. So then, they that are in the flesh, those who are carnal, try to live in the power of the human flesh by willpower, cannot please God. Pretty simple statement. Okay, step one, first base, you're a sinner. You can't, you can't live for God even if you want to. Step two, uh, second base, uh, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Not ever going to happen. You're never going to get second base. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If you're saved, that's what that's saying. If you're saved, if the Spirit of God dwell in you, then you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. What's he saying? You have, you have the power to get there. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's not saved. So you say, well, I, I can't do that. Well, the only reason you can't do it is if you don't have the Spirit. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're not saved. So stop trying to live the Christ life uh, in the power of the flesh. You need to get saved first. But here he says that uh, you, if you are not in the flesh but in the spirit, that means you have the spirit and you can do what God asks you to do. Now come to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to go to third base. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, even though I move about in this body of flesh, we do not war after the flesh. My strength is not from this body. I'm fighting a battle, a spiritual battle, and I'm not warring on the strength of my flesh. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are what? Are not carnal. They're not of this body but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, remember this. When you get on your knees before God, Satan ought to tremble. That's the kind of power that's yours. You get on your knees. If you are right with God and you are uh, in the vine, abiding in the vine, when you get on your knees, Satan will tremble. 
He's going to say, uh oh. There, there he is on his knees again. Now look what he says. Mighty through God to pulling down the, of strongholds. Now look at the strongholds. Casting down imaginations. That's your fantasy life. Cast them down. Now what is the terminology? Well, the Corinthians would have understood this terminology. What did they do with their idols? They put them on the high places. So what is this? He's talking about your imaginations, your fantasy life is a high thing. It's an idol that you worship. Cast it down. They went, uh, Christians and Jews, they went into land, the areas where they conquered, and they tore down all the high places, broke up the idols. In Ezekiel time, in Ezekiel's time and Elijah's time, they crushed them to dust, literally pounded them to dust. Casting down imaginations, imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. That is the exaltation, raising up false beliefs above God. And bringing into captivity every thought into obedience of Christ. Every sin, every temptation begins in your thought life. And that's where you deal it with it first. Now, when you do that, and of course you come now, you're now you're on third base, you're dealing with the you're dealing with this in the power of the Spirit of God. It's mighty through God that's pulling down of strongholds. Otherwise, it's not a carnal warfare. You can't do it in your flesh. You need the Spirit of God to do it. To help you with it. And when you're struggling with it, plead with Jesus. Go to Jesus in prayer. Don't try to willpower your way through it. Go to the Lord Jesus and say, God, I'm having some struggle with this right now. And I need your help. Guess what you'll get? You'll get his help. <laughs> you're not longer fo focusing on your strength. You're focusing on his strength. Now you're at third base. Come to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Now we're coming home. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Literally, walk in the power of the Spirit. I'll tell you this, if you've gotten this far and you are in the Spirit of God, when you, when you walk in the Spirit, you don't have to run for home. <laughs> uh, it's already yours. Walk in the power of the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, for years now, we've heard the liberal media and, of course, politicians say, just say no. I say, don't, don't say just say no, say yes. But don't say yes to sin, say yes to the Holy Spirit. And when you can say yes to the Holy Spirit, he'll give you the power to say no to sin. In fact, the, even the temptation will go away. Start having a conversation with God. When temptation comes along, go to the Word of God and rebuke Satan with the Word of God. And doing so, flee to the Holy Spirit. He says, walk in the power of the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Says, now here's a fact, here's a fact. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. Your flesh is lusting against the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is uh, fighting against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to another. You, they can't partner together the flesh. The one has to die. The flesh has to die. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I die daily. The flesh doesn't power. Doesn't, uh, doesn't partner with the Spirit. It is your will partnering with God's will. And God will empower you. So he says, and these are contrary to one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The, the flesh doesn't want you to live for Christ. <laughs> I don't know how much simpler it can be, but how complicated this become in this world because of false doctrine. The purpose of enabling grace is for obedience to the faith among all nations. Romans 1 5. Look, if you don't live any different than the world lives, nobody's going to give you any credibility. They'll just laugh at you. I remember I had a friend of mine who professed to get saved, he was in the Navy. And uh, 
you know, he might have gotten saved. I didn't necessarily repent of sin. I dealt with him about that. But he was, uh, you know, all the guys on the ship, the pot smokers would all get together in, uh, in an evening down in their areas and they'd all sit around and smoke pot and drink story, tell stories. Well, he went down there after he made a profession of faith in Christ and uh, during that same time smoking pot with all of his buddies, he started witnessing for Christ. And uh, he didn't find out till many, many weeks later that everybody that he smoked pot with uh, were, were, were laughing him to scorn. They were ridiculing him. But when he did find that out, he said, oh. And he went back to that same group and apologized for his inconsistency in his testimony. And he started le leading those guys to Christ. Later got involved in a boys' home ministry and helped many young boys, rebellious young boys, uh, through a numerous years of ministry recovered, you know, many, many young boys from worldliness and led them to Christ. But it all started right there. So this refers specifically, uh, God has a purpose in everything, and this refers specifically to the spread of Christianity by obedience to the Great Commission and evangelism and discipleship, but we've been given obedience to the faith among all nations. The purpose of grace is to enable the believer to obey his calling in Jesus Christ in doing this work of the ministry. And the faith refers to the whole body of Christian doctrine that is to be lived in and through the believer's life and the power or enabling of the indwelling Christ. So Christian doctrine is the teachings of Jesus Christ. Don't call yourself a Christian if you're not following the teachings of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Here we have another great text. Now, I again believe that Ephesians chapter 4 is the heart of the epistle. Remember this morning I said the heart of 2 Corinthians is what? Chapter 5. The heart of the book of Ephesians is chapter 4. Now there's truth building up to it, and there's truth that moves after it. But the heart of it here is in Ephesians chapter 4. If you don't understand the, uh, that election in the first three chapters, it's talking about vocational election to the priesthood of the believer, uh, and the church is that, is that group of believers that, uh, to which it refers, you're not going to miss that. You're going to miss most of what chapter four says. He says, Paul. I, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of what the vocation wherewith you are called. Every believer has a call to salvation. Every believer has a vocational calling. That is the priesthood of all believers, and it is vocational. We are elected, we are chosen, we are called to that vocation. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Well, what is the unity of the spirit? It's orthodoxy, orthopraxy, orthopathy. Orthodoxy is right doctrine, Orth orthopraxy is right practice, orthopathy is right emotions. Taking, making sure that our anger doesn't turn to wrath and those kind of things. Love, those kind of uh, things. So, uh, and it goes on and says, there's one body, one spirit, even as you are called, again, vocational calling and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, not many, one baptism, that's an efficacious baptism, that's a baptism with the spirit of God, not water baptism. And there's only one that happens one time. If you have water baptism, you can be baptized more than once. I know I, I was baptized more than once. I didn't understand it the first time. I got baptized the second time. When I did understand it. When God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and look at this. Now, now look at that. You there? And in you all. That's the Spirit of Christ. 
But unto a few of us is given grace. Did I, is that right? No. Unto every one of us is given grace. With this enabling grace. Every single one of us. According to the measure of the gift of Christ. That's abundance. Another verse of scripture talks about unsearchable riches of grace. Now I'll come to Jude verse one, chapter 1. And well, there's only one chapter, verse 3. Now, there's one faith, right? In the Bible, that's called the faith. The faith. The definite article there in the Greek text means there's only one. And it's the faith. That This is the faith. Right here. And scripturalized in 66 books of scripture. When you know the word of God, it is the faith. I've said many times, faith is not a, a blind leap in the darkness. Faith is an informed leap into the light. And that is a very important truth. Look at verse 3. Beloved believers, when I give all diligence to write unto you of what? The common salvation. Everybody gets saved exactly the same, by grace through faith. He says, it was needful for me to write unto you. Why was it needful? Because there were people that were distorting this common salvation. And there were all kinds of ways coming into Christianity. So it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for what? The faith. What is that? The Bible. It, it's, it never ends. And then it says, which was once, literally once for all and forever, delivered unto the saints. We are the keepers of the truth. If, if the Bible is going to be preserved, it's not going to be preserved by you taking it and hiding it on your shelf someplace in your closet and uh, never touching it. It's going to be preserved by you studying it, living it, and teaching it everywhere. That's how we preserve the Word of God. Every one of us have to do that. Now, as we said this morning, all believers have an apostleship. They are sent into the world with a high vocational calling and a great commission to evangelize and make disciples. Every single one of us. Every believer has received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who will empower him to do whatever God asks him to do. What God commands you to do, God will uh, enable you to do. Every believer now will stand before the judgment seat of Christ without excuse because we've been given all things that pertain to unto life and godliness for the things that they have either failed to do or the things they attempted to do but did in the flesh. And at that day we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and our works will be tried by fire. That which is done in the flesh will end up at ashes at our feet. That which is done in the power of the Spirit will be gold, silver, and precious stones and they will be gathered all around us. And they are going to be people. The fruit, that imperishable fruit that we will produce through a spirit-filled life. What we do, we do for the name of Jesus. To be successful, we must do it fully yielded to and by the enabling of his indwelling spirit. Now we're going to begin tonight on the eight practical manifestations of a functionally mature Christian. If you're going to look at a functionally mature Christian, what, how, how would you know that that person is a functionally mature Christian? There are eight things in Romans chapter eight, verse eight, chapter one, verse eight through fifty that tells us what a functionally mature Christian is. Paul was such a being, and I've got them highlighted up there for you. So underline them in your Bible as we read the text. First, I thank my God. Paul was a thankful Christian. Through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. Paul was a serving Christian. In the gospel of his son, he served, of course, by preaching the gospel. 
that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. He prayed for one another. I like what D.L. or uh, Spurgeon said when someone asked him, How come your ministry is so successful? He said, My people pray for me. He didn't take credit for it. He said, My people pray for me, and then God empowered it. Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God. He was preoccupied with the will of God. To come unto you. For I long to see you. He was a fellowshipping Christian. He wanted to be with believers. Show me a Lone Ranger Christian. I'll show you someone who's not a mature Christian. Someone says, uh, I don't need to study the Bible. Uh, I can uh, worship God anyway. What does that tell me? There's a man that doesn't study the Bible. Right? I don't need to go to church. I study. I can study the Bible anywhere. That's a man who hasn't studied the Bible. If he studied the Bible, he knew he needed, he, he needed the church. God ordained it for him. He said, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. By the way, anytime Paul says I would not have you ignorant, there is a presumption that they are. And he's talk, he's correcting it. That oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. He was a purposeful Christian. That is a sign of maturity. But was let hitherto. Otherwise it was, he, he was not allowed at that time. That I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I'm a debtor. Paul understood that he'd been bought with a price. He was a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in, as in me, I am ready. Paul was a ready Christian. He was ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Every time there was an opportunity, Paul did not uh, wait upon that opportunity. He made opportunities. Create your own opportunities. Be ready to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I get in a conversation with a, with a lost person, I'm waiting for an opening where I can introduce spiritual conversation and begin to talk with them about the Lord. Now, spiritual maturity is evident in a believer's life through the exhibition of, a, of spiritual practices. I'm going to say that one more time. Spiritual maturity is evident in a believer's life through the exhibition of spiritual practices. If, you're going to, if you consider yourself to be a mature spiritual person, then you ought to be showing forth spiritual practices. A Christianity that does not exhibit these spiritual practices as the norm of everyday existence is not a spiritual Christianity. Now, yes, every one of us will slip back into carnality occasionally. And that is where we do damage. But we don't have to live there. Now, as we come to these things, I'm going to start some of these tonight. We're not going to get all through eight of these tonight, but we're going to look at some of them. We're going to probably just get through the first one tonight. Paul was a thankful Christian. Romans 1.8. Are you thankful? I like the, what I call the thank you psalm. You know what that is? Psalm 136. And Psalm 136 is based upon what is called the divine constant. And the divine constant is repeated over and over again in the text. His mercy endureth forever. That's a divine constant. Do you deserve it? No. <laughs> Not one bit. And that is the great truth of it. So it de details the spirit of thankfulness and remembrance of God's ongoing mercy and intervening work in the lives of his children. How many times did God continue to intervene in the lives of the children of Israel when they kept getting caught up in idolatry? How long was his long suffering? <laughs> that is what this psalm is about. Now, let's apply it to us. How many times has God forgiven you? How many times has he given you a new beginning? His mercy endureth forever. Look at Psalm 136, verse 1. I'm going to read this psalm tonight, this whole psalm. And then we're going to close. It's called the thankful psalm. 
or the, the psalm of thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for, here's why, He is good. For, or because, His mercy endureth forever. This is again the divine constant. Right in the margin of your Bible. His mercy endureth forever. The divine constant. Don't you, aren't you glad that we have some constants upon which we can depend? I'm glad. <laughs> Verse 2. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, uh, unto the God of gods. Why? For his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. Why? For his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth works, doeth great works. For his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens. For his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters. For his mercy endureth forever. I think God's trying to tell us something. <laughs> to him that stretcheth out the earth. His mercy endureth forever. To him that made great light. For his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by the day. That is an act of the mercy of God. His mercy endureth forever. To the moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand, with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. The point is, they didn't deserve it. It was God's mercy. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. They didn't deserve that. They're a bunch of murmurers and complainers. And made Israel a pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. God in protecting the children of Israel overthrew the most powerful nation on planet earth at that time. An army of thousands upon hundreds of thousands of soldiers. And God just drowned them all. That was an act of mercy. Otherwise they would have come after Israel and destroyed them all. To him which led his people through the wilderness. For his mercy for, dureth forever. Now you don't have to read too much about the wilderness journey. To understand that God's a merciful God. Over and over again his people uh, rebelled against him. Verse 17, to him which smote great things for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings for his mercy endureth forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave their land for an heritage for his mercy endureth forever. They didn't deserve any of that. Even an heritage unto Israel is servant for his mercy endureth forever. Who remembered us in our lowest state? We're fallen. We're sinners. You know that? You don't deserve the grace of God. For his mercy endureth forever. And hath redeemed us from our enemies. For his mercy endureth forever. The greatest enemy is sin. And he's delivered us from it. Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Why? For his mercy endureth forever. Every time you get up in the morning, every day you walk and take a breath of air into your lungs, you ought to say, God, thank you for your mercy. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve the blessings you give me. I don't even deserve a moment of peace in my life. I don't deserve the happiness that I enjoy, the joy that is mine in Christ. I don't, joy, I don't deserve the wonderful children you've given me. I don't, give the, I, don't, I don't deserve the job that I have, the home that I have. I don't, endure, I don't, I don't deserve the church that you've given me. But thank you, God, your mercy endureth forever. And sometimes the best place to do that is to get right on your face before God and do it. Now sometimes I go through my day and I just, I think about the wife that God has given me, the people that God has given me to minister to, 
the privilege of serving him all these years, and I just weep. I just cry. I'm not crying tears of sadness. I'm crying tears of rejoicing because his mercy endureth forever. And tomorrow, when I start out a new day, I know I'm going to start out in the mercy of God. God is going to do things that I don't deserve. God is going to use me in ways I don't deserve him to use me. And that is true of you. Be a thankful Christian. But we are thanking God for things instead of what God is. That God is a merciful God and his mercy endureth forever. Every day of you have of this life, you're going to need the mercy of God. And every day you will get it. That is the divine constant. Are you born again? <laughs> Repent. Believe. Confess and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be born again tonight. If you're not sure about being saved and be born again, I would love to talk with you. I would love to sit down and be able to share the gospel with you and, and lead you into how to be born again. Don't put it off. We love you. In a moment in the twinkling of the eye, the Lord's going to call us all out of this world. And in that moment, if when God calls us out of here, you will still be here if you're lost. And God will send a strong delusion that you will believe the lie. Because you've rejected him now. Receive Jesus Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. Be born again today. Father God, I bow before you tonight and thank you that your mercy endureth forever. That you've given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And that the riches of your grace are so far beyond our comprehension that, Lord, we barely can even talk about them, let alone understand them. And we rejoice, Lord, in your goodness. We pray tonight that you'd help us to be better servants and better models of Jesus Christ. Help us to be more diligent in our efforts to bring lost people to know him who is to know life eternal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.